what's interesting is we've also been talking about this drug with our familiarity to it, right? Yes. We, we've chased it down. We've followed mm -hmm. it. We've fought for it. But I think in the community, it's not something yet that mo most doctors will be familiar with. Now, slightly different is aribulin, right? Because aribulin has been FDA approved in breast cancer. I imagine a lot of community doctors uh, work with that. And, and there was a very similar study and a, a very similar approval. And I know, I know Shrey, as you were, you were very prominent and influential in that study, senior author on the paper that got it, got it approved. Why don't you tell us a little bit about aribulin? So this is another old new drug, not as old as trabectidin probably, but uh, certainly new for the sarcoma field, but older, relatively speaking, in the context of community oncologists having experience with it for the breast cancer uh, population. So the mechanism of action is interesting. Uh, I think generically, or grilling it down to the very basics, it's an antimitotic activity agent. Uh, but it exerts its antimitotic activity in a novel or a unique way where it just binds to the positive end of the tubulin that then depolymerizes and doesn't cause any adverse effects, if you will. More interesting, though, about the mechanism of action is, or may well be, its effects on the tumor microenvironment. I think there is some evidence to suggest that it uh, prevents from invasion and migration of tumor cells. It prevents the epithelial mesenchymal transition, if you will, the EMT. Uh, maybe even some anti-angiogenic effect, and it may be this effects on the tumor microenvironment, and that's sort of what we were alluding to even with, with, with trabectidin, that they may be the more interesting effects, if you will, that explain some of the results. Yeah. The trial was designed very similarly. It shows you that the same culprits were designing the trials, I guess. It's, again, based on the European phase two data, liposarcomas and what they call adipocytic sarcomas, we'll call them liposarcomas for our conversation. That were the subsets where there was known activity or prominent activity. Those were chosen for, for, for the eligible population. Patients were randomized one-to-one -one between aribulin and carbazine or DTIC. Uh, treated until maximum response. The drugs given intravenously on day one and day eight. Uh, generally, very well tolerated drug. I think there are certain toxicities from the drug standpoint that one needs to keep in mind. One of the unique toxicities is peripheral neuropathy. Maybe a, approaching 20% of patients may see some degree of peripheral neuropathy. Serious peripheral neuropathy is much less common. But so if somebody was a diabetic, for example, and had pre-existing neuropathy or had a pre-existing neuropathy for other reasons like Mancristine or something, one needs to be careful in using the drug. Uh, neutropenia, neutropenic fever was not a major issue. Uh, thrombocytopenia is much less compared to the carbazine, for example. So the myelosuppressive effects are not that big a concern. Marty brought up the issue of alopecia in patient population early on, and this is clearly a drug that does not cause alopecia, so I think that can be a helpful uh, issue or that's less than the gen uh, other agents. From an efficacy standpoint, I think the primary endpoint of the trial was overall survival, and it did improve the overall survival by two plus months, 11 and 11.3 versus 12.5 or something like that, or 10.3, uh, 12.5 months. And based on that endpoint, I think the drug got approved. But when you look at the forest plots and look at the subsets, the lyomyosarcoma activity was identical or equivalent to the, the carbazine arm. The liposarcoma subset clearly did significantly better, where the median overall survivals were significantly different, eight months versus 15 months kind of things. And because of that drastic difference, I think the FDA chose to approve this drug primarily for liposarcomas. Yeah. And you brought up the question, compare and contrast with, with trabectidin, I guess the subsets of liposarcomas, again, this may be one that's kind of the mirror image, if you will, of, of trabectidin, where the benefit seems to be far more profound in the WellDiff DDIF liposarcoma subset compared to the myxoid yeah. lipo, and that probably yeah. was the reason why uh, Damon said earlier that for the myxoid lipo, he would put trabectidin above aribulin and vice versa yeah. for the well diff diff liposarcoma. Yeah. So I think this is a drug that has been around in the therapeutic armamentarium for oncologists who treat breast cancer a lot more often than yeah. they treat sarcomas. Uh, but certainly for, from my personal standpoint, I think the approval is for liposarcomas, so coverage can be an issue. 
But the way I would interpret the data is that it's equally as effective for the leiomyosarcoma subset uh, also. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think in my personal experience, I think it's generally been a well-tolerated drug that patients can, can take for, for the usual six plus cycles yeah. and, and uh, benefit yeah. from it. I think, I think that's a great thing. I mean, I, I also, uh, in talking to Patrick Shopsky, who was uh, you know, one of those who also helped usher this drug through, is that there's nice responses in pleomorphic liposarcomas, which is something we haven't spoken about either. But liposarcoma, disease that was always thought to be chemo insensitive, right? Now two drugs that are on the market. But, it, but it, I think what's important, and I'm hearing here, are these nuances of these studies, right? So when we hear that drugs are FDA approved, there are some nuances. And as experts, we're kind of hearing there may be a way that you're positioning drugs when you look at patients. Liposarcoma, Mark, same thing. Do you have a way that you position them, or would you... Uh, so I, I don't think anything different than what we've always di already discussed, and I think certainly for the myxoid, um, the trabectidin, um, certainly higher, and um, aribulin for the other subtypes traditionally. Yeah. So I think it also points out a problem with the way we design studies. Decarbazine actually is more active than we wanted to give it credit for in leiomyosarcomas. Well, so the fact that aribulin was as active as decarbazine and it lost an FDA approval because of that is kind of a darn shame. Correct. You know, we, yeah. we weren't trying to displace it. We were just trying to add a new agent to the armamentarium where, where we need more active that, agents. That's exactly right. And, you know, and a lot of times, too, people will use decarbazine with an anthracycline early on, and so it would have been nice to have another drug there. But again, um, still very impressive that some of these drugs are coming into, coming into uh, the realm of what we can use.